join with me responsibly for our call to worship, and of course will be on our screen as well as can be found printed in your bulletins. It is from the 125th Psalm, our call to worship. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forevermore. For the scepter of wickedness shall not rest on the land allotted to the righteous. Lest the righteous stretch out their hands to do wrong, do the will of the Lord Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather with you this day. Thank you that you know each one of us by name and have caused us to walk with you. We say that we are dependent upon you, Lord, and our trust is in you completely. As we now prepare ourselves for this morning's worship, We ask that you would, by the power of your Holy Spirit, inspire our hearts this morning. Come, fill our lives with your love. Fill our conversations with your grace and truth. And Lord, fill this time with your presence so that all that we say and all that we do is for your glory, honor, and praise. And now let us join our voices and pray that prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Our hymn of praise, again, will be on the screen as well as can be found in our hymnals on page 354. All that are able, let us please rise as we sing together, Christ has made the sure foundation.
Now let us silently go to the Lord and confess our personal sins. Amen. The Apostle John wrote in 1 John chapter 4, This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. We have now humbly confessed our sins before God, and God is faithful and just forgiving us and purifying us from all unrighteousness. Amen. Our hymn of assurance, once again, will be on the screen, as well as can be found in our hymnals on page 250. All that are able, please stand as we sing together, and can it be. <clears throat>
please be seated. What a joy it is to come each and every Sunday morning to worship the Lord amongst the community of faith, our brothers and sisters in Christ, and what a joy it is as well to come into the Lord's sort of special presence, immediate presence in prayer, and that's what we're going to do now. So let's bow together both our heads as well as our hearts in prayer. Let's pray. What a privilege it is indeed, O Lord, to come into your presence in prayer. How awesome it is that when we have problems, knowing exactly what to say and how to say it can be a problem for us, but yet your Holy Spirit takes over and intercedes on our behalf. Help us to come this morning with a humble heart, a grateful heart, a heart that is more eager to praise you for what we have than to put check marks on our list for what we would like to have. Father, we thank you for your awesome love, a love that created each and every one of us always with a purpose in mind. We thank you for providing us with all the necessities of life. Thank you, Lord, for the special people that you have called to be a part of our life, our spouses, our children, our parents, our siblings, our friends. Thank you, Lord, for the family of faith called the church and how wonderful it is to be a part of this very special family. Thank you, Lord, for the Bible, your word that speaks to us and acts as our guide in this life. Thank you, Father, for the Holy Spirit that sustains us and empowers us when you call us to serve. Thank you, most of all, Father, for the gift of our salvation, purchased by the life, the ministry, the death, and the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father God, hear our prayers today for those who are in need of our prayers. We pray for any who are in hospital or shortly have returned from one. Bless, strengthen those who are recovering at home. And a special blessing, Father, we pray on those who are caring for them at home. We pray for that person, Lord, who's waiting to hear the results of a medical test and perhaps the progress that of treatment being made. May the results be reassuring, O oh God. We pray for the person today who is heartbroken because of something that has taken place in their life. May they come to experience the mending of a broken heart. May the one, O oh God, who nears the end of life's journey receive hope over the news of eternal life that is promised to all your children. We also pray, Lord, for those members of our church family who will shortly be returning to their homes to the north of us. Grant unto them a safe journey. A special prayer, Lord, for Pat, who is moving to a new home in the north where she will be close to family. Bless her and thank you for her presence in our midst. Father God, we offer our prayers for our president and those who serve alongside of him. We pray that they, along with that counterbalance known sometimes as the opposition, that they might be able to work together to make this country a better country and this world a safer world. Bless our leaders with a gift of knowledge, discernment, wisdom, and the willingness to stand firm on what is right, even when the wrong is popular. Here, these are prayers, O God, in the name of him who is referred to in Scripture as the Prince of Peace, even Jesus Christ. And it is in his name that we pray, and we pray that his will might always be done. Amen. Let us continue with our worship of Almighty God as we present unto him our Sunday 
morning offering. Father, you have given us so much, and we give so little in comparison, but we pray, Lord, that you would receive these tithes and offerings, that you would use them to further the ministry of this church and the ministry of the kingdom, both here and abroad, for Christ's sake, amen. Please be seated. Our confession of faith this morning, which certainly goes along with my sermon, is from the Westminster Confession, chapter 32, The Condition of Man After Death and the Resurrection of the Dead. Article number three, let's read it together. Christ wants us to be completely convinced that there is going to be a day of judgment as a deterrent to sin for everyone and as an added consolation for the godly in their suffering. He has also made sure that no one knows when that day will be, so that we may never rest secure in our worldly surroundings, but not knowing what hour the Lord will come, we must always be alert and may always be ready to say, come Lord Jesus, come quickly, amen. Good morning. <laughs> this morning's reading is from Psalms 122, verses 1 through 9. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem built as a city that is bound firmly together, <clears throat> to which the tribes go up. The tribes of the Lord, as was decreed for Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord. 
There thrones for judgment were set, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Praise be within your walls and security within your towers. For my brothers and companions' sake, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. This is the word of the Lord. I bought this ginormous Bible, that's the term my granddaughter uses, because I was getting to the point where I couldn't read my large print Bible without reading glasses. And I don't know about you, but whenever I see a preacher with the reading glasses, it feels like he's looking down his nose at you. I do not want to look down my nose at Grace. I respect and love all of you. So if you looked at this, this is the largest print Bible that I have ever seen. I don't have any trouble reading it. Well, let me uh, introduce the sermon by saying that the subject that I'm going to talk about today, end times, it's the fancy term in theology is eschatology, is, in my opinion, the most frequently misunderstood has the worst teaching and some of the worst heresy connected to it throughout the history of the church, especially in recent times. <clears throat> I've read recently from two members of Billy Graham's family, and I'll quote directly their statement, I am convinced that the Lord will return in my lifetime. I want to ask them, what convinced you to make this unbiblical statement? Jesus says in the 24th chapter of Matthew that no one will know when he returns, not the angels, not the Son of Man himself. And yet, these folks know that he will return in their lifetime. It's, it's a trend. Um, back in the 1800s, there was a man named William Miller. He was a lapsed Baptist who came to faith during the War of 1812. Uh, he was miraculous, miraculously spared and began to read the Bible. He had no training, but he interpreted the book of Daniel as saying that Jesus would return somewhere between March 21st, 1843 and March 21st, 1844. Uh, that is known as the Great Disappointment. Uh, that was the beginning of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. A person who was deeply influenced by Miller was a man named Charles Taze Russell. He was a Presbyterian from Pittsburgh. And he believed that Jesus would return, according to his calculations, in 1917. And so he and a group of people that called themselves Jehovah's Witnesses stood on the hill and waited. When it didn't happen, he said Jesus returned spiritually. The best-selling Christian book of the 20th century was the book The Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey. Um, Hal Lindsey predicted that Jesus would return in 1974. And even though it didn't happen, he continued to be on TV and radio talking about the end times. Uh, just as a little parenthesis, my brother lived in Palm Desert, Palm Springs area of California. My brother is an entrepreneur. He made over a million dollars uh, in apartments in Palm Desert. He lived in a McMansion, but the fanciest house on his street was Hal Lindsey's. Now, bring it up to 1988. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm blanking on his name. Harold Camping. Harold Camping was on family radio, and he predicted that Jesus would come back on May 21st, 1988. People sent him millions of dollars. If... Jesus is coming back. Why did he need all this money? Okay, so when he didn't come back, he then revised his calculations. 
that he would come back on September 6, 1994. When that didn't happen, he revised his calculations that he would come back May 21st, 2011. And this was the biggest announcement that brought in the most money. And like the Jehovah's Witnesses, when it didn't happen, he said Jesus returned spiritually. Harold Camping died and left an estate of $75 million. I look at that and say, really? How naive can people be? It's clear that no one will know. It's also clear to me that much of what is interpreted as talking about Christ's second coming is really talking about something else. I'm going to read from Luke chapter 21, verses 5 to 36. Listen, for this is the word of God. And as I read, see if you can figure out the context of Jesus' teaching. What is he teaching about? And while some were speaking of the temple, how it was adorned with noble stones and offerings, he, Jesus, said, As for these things that you see, the days will come when there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And they asked him, Teacher, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? And he said, See that you are not led astray, for many will come in my name saying, I am he, and the time is at hand. Do not go after them. And when you hear of wars and tumults, do not be terrified, for these things must first take place, but the end will not be at once. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes and in various places famines and pestilence, and there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. But before all this, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. This will be your opportunity to bear witness. Settle it, therefore, in your minds, not to mediate beforehand, or meditate beforehand how to answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be del delivered up even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and some of you will be put to death. You will be hated by all for my name's sake, but not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance you will gain your lives. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let those who are inside the city depart, and let not those who are out in the country enter it. For these are days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. Alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, for there will be great distress upon the earth and wrath against this people. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among all nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And there will be signs in sun and moon and stars, and on the earth distress of nations in perplexity because of the roaring of the sea and the waves, people fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming in the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory." Now when these things begin to take place, straighten up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. And he told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they come out in leaf, you see for yourselves and know that the summer is already near. So also when you see these things take place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all has taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and cares of this life, and that day come upon you suddenly like a trap, for it will come upon all who dwell on the face of the whole earth. But stay awake at all times, 
praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that you are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. This is the word of the Lord. Well, there are three sections in Matthew, Mark, and Luke that are very similar, and they're known as the little apocalypse, the little revelation. I believe that this passage is mainly talking about the destruction of Jerusalem and only secondarily the second coming of Jesus Christ. The context of Scripture is always crucial. James Kennedy used to say, a text without a context is a pretext. If you ignore the context of Scripture, you can make it say what it doesn't say. But the context for this passage is Jesus and his disciples are looking at the great temple and they marvel. And Jesus says, not one stone will stand upon another. It'll be thrown down. He's talking about the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. Herod's temple was one of the wonders of the ancient world. <clears throat> Some people are troubled by verse 6 that says, Not one stone, uh, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down, because there are some stones that remain, the western wall or the wailing wall. But that was not part of the actual temple. That was part of the temple mount. And Jesus was talking in a phenomenological way. He's saying the temple will be destroyed. There are limestone foundation stones of the temple that are 40 feet long, 12 feet high, and 18 feet thick. They weigh almost seven tons. And engineers, archaeologists, have no idea how they were brought to the temple, but they were. It was an amazing, amazing building. But Jesus is prophesying that it will be destroyed. And that happened in 70 A.D. The Roman general Titus surrounded Jerusalem and the city was under siege. People stayed within the walls and initially the Romans didn't break through. They decided to starve them out. And that's literally what happened. Over a million Jews died of starvation. There was even cannibalism, which is abhorrent to Jewish people. There was one group of people, one group, that wasn't killed in the siege of Jerusalem. Do you know who it was? Jewish Christians, because they read and knew this passage, and they fled to the hills, as Jesus told them to. They went to the city of Pella in Jordan, and they were spared. <clears throat> But the temple was utterly destroyed. <clears throat> the Romans eventually cut down hundreds of trees from the Mount of Olives and they set them on fire and burned the limestone of the city walls and then the temple. Jesus said there will be a number of signs pointing to the destruction of Jerusalem. False prophets will abound. As you can imagine, in the first century, there were many, many false Christs who claimed to be the second coming of Jesus. Generally, if they were just local nut jobs, the Romans left them alone. But if they amassed a following and began to look threatening, the Romans did to them the same thing they did to the real Messiah. They crucified them. Surprisingly, none of them rose again from the dead. False messiahs will abound in natural disasters, and wars will increase. 
Probably the most famous natural disaster of the first century was the eruption of Vesuvius, the destruction of Pompeii. But like every century, there were earthquakes, there were natural disasters aplenty. And wars were continual. Roman, <clears throat> the Roman army, which was incredible, fought throughout the first century against the Parthians, against the uh, British, the Armenians, and in the year 68, there was a civil war, the war of the four emperors who were all trying to gain control. Wars and rumors of wars throughout the first century. And then Jesus predicts that Christians will be persecuted. Now, keep in mind, when Jesus was teaching here, there is only one person who had been persecuted or martyred for his faith, John the Baptist. However, in the middle of the first century, especially with the coming of Emperor Nero, Christians were slaughtered wholesale. The Apostle Peter was crucified upside down. The Apostle Paul was killed by the sword, decapitated. Christians fought the lions in the Colosseum. And hundreds, thousands of Christians were literally set on fire to be human torches for the games in the Colosseum at night. <clears throat> Christians were persecuted severely. And then Jesus also predicts that Jerusalem will be surrounded by armies and the abomination of desolation will stand in the holy place. I've already talked about the siege of Jerusalem where the Roman armies surrounded the city. But what is this abomination of desolation that the Gospels talk about? Well, to understand that, we have to understand some Jewish history. In 165 B.C., <clears throat> a Roman general, Antiochus Epiphanes, the name means the glorious appearance, he was a very humble guy, he came into Jerusalem and destroyed the Jews who were living there. He went into the temple and he committed the ultimate sacrilege. He sacrificed a pig on the altar. That was known by the Jews as the abomination of desolation. When the Romans in 70 AD entered the temple with their eagle symbols, that was also seen as an abomination because it was a violation of the second commandment against images. <clears throat> Now, the most difficult part of this passage is when Jesus says there will be signs in the heavens and the Son of Man will come in a cloud with great power and glory. Again, what does that mean? Did it mean that Jesus returned physically in 70 AD? Of course not. Again, we need to understand the Old Testament. Listen to Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Most people think when Jesus used the term son of man, he was using a term of humility in contrast to son of God. Not true. The son of man is God. Daniel is prophesying about the Messiah who appears before the Ancient of Days, God the Father, and he appears in a cloud with great glory, power, and dominion. 
I believe what Jesus is saying here, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago when we talked about Christ's ascension, that when he ascended into heaven, he was given all judgment, glory, dominion, and judgment. And in 70 AD, I believe Jesus judged Jerusalem and found it wanting. Up until 70 AD, interestingly, archaeologists have seen that in Jerusalem and in a number of cities in Israel, Christian churches were right next to synagogues. They worshipped, as it were, together. Christianity was seen as a kind of a branch of Judaism. We now call <clears throat> completed Jews as a term for Jewish Christians. But after 70 AD, never again. Christianity, Judaism, separated. The Apostle Peter says that we are the new Israel. We are a holy nation, Christians. We are God's chosen people. God has chosen us Christians to be His chosen people. Now Paul says there will eventually in the fullness of time be a restoration of Israel. I believe many Jews will come to faith in Christ before Christ returns. Now why do I believe that all of what Jesus is talking about occurred in the first century, in 70 A.D. R.C. Sproul in his book, <clears throat> The Last Times According to Jesus, emphasizes this verse, and I think it is to be emphasized. Jesus says to his disciples, truly, this is verse 32, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all has taken place. A generation in Jewish thinking was 40 years. If Jesus was speaking around the year 30, which I think he was, this took place in that generation. <clears throat> now, how do we respond? How do we respond both to Christ's teaching here and to his second coming. <clears throat> I do think he talks about his second coming after this verse about these things will take place during this generation. He says, watch yourselves, for it will come upon all who dwell on the face of the earth. Matthew's gospel has a number of parables that are talking about Jesus' return. The parable of the talents. The parable of the wise and foolish virgins. The parable of the sheep and the goats are all parables about Christ's return and His judgment. How are we to respond to the New Testament teaching of the second coming of Christ, which I fervently believe in? Jesus is coming back. And I believe it could be tomorrow. I believe it could be 10,000 years down the road. No one knows. Well, the message of the New Testament is very simple. Be ready. Be ready. How can we do that? How can we be prepared either for our own death or for the second coming of Jesus Christ? If Jesus were to come tomorrow... I would want him to see us studying his word, praying in the spirit, engaging in Christian fellowship, using our spiritual gifts, sharing the gospel with others. That's the message of the New Testament. Christ is going to return we will meet him face to face, either upon our death or his return. Be ready. We should neither predict, ignore, or fear Christ's second coming. Let's pray.
Lord Jesus, we praise you for your first coming when you lived a life of perfect obedience to the Father so that you could be our atoning sacrifice for all of our sin. We praise you that you went to the cross for our sake, that with your death, the power of sin died with you. The penalty of sin was erased for those who trust in you. And with your resurrection, we are given new life, life abundant and life eternal. We praise you that you are the ascended Lord who sends your gifts upon us. And Lord, one of those gifts is this supper, which is not just a memorial. We are to remember you, but it is also an infilling. As we partake in faith, Lord, you've promised to fill us with your Holy Spirit. And so now we pray that you would set apart these elements from their common use and make this to be for us a sacrament, a sacred moment in which we encounter you as we partake of the bread and the wine in faith. We pray this in your strong and blessed name. Amen. Listen to the words of institution as we find them in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. The Apostle Paul writes that I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And when he gave thanks, he broke it, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. All of you drink of it. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show forth the Lord's death until he returns. The Apostle Paul also warns that we are not to partake of the Lord's Supper in a way that does not discern the body. And I think he meant two things by that. First of all, that we are part of the body of Christ, that we've received Christ by faith, that we trust in Him as Lord and Savior. If you have not accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, please do not take this meal, but use this time instead to think about His love for you and His offer of grace. It also means that we're to be part of the body of Christ, the church. And if you're a part of this church, if you're a part of another church, you are invited to partake. <clears throat> Elders, come now, for all is ready. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you abide in me, you will bear much fruit, for apart from me, you can do nothing. Let's sing our closing hymn together.
out of curiosity, for how many of you was that a new hymn? Okay, we need to teach more about the second coming. We're closer today than we were yesterday. Now may the God of peace, who brought from the dead our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. To him be glory, majesty, and dominion now and forevermore. And let God's people say, Amen. Amen.